attachment will stop working. And of course, the system is optimized to work in salt water. It costs $1,100. This vehicle is already delighting tourists in the US, Europe, North Africa, and Asia. It is called the Water Pillar, and it combines the advantages of a catamaran and a boat, allowing you to discover a new dimension of water activities. The standard Water Pillar is about 7 feet tall and 8.2 feet wide. It's primarily made of polymers, aluminium, and stainless steel, and weighs 375 pounds. The vehicle is ready to operate in both fresh and salt water, and it's also capable of driving on land. If necessary, the manufacturer will build a custom version, and the simplicity of the design opens up a wide range of possibilities for upgrading. For example, you can add a water shooting system or an engine. The recommended price for the standard version is about $5,000. How to make your child a great swimmer? Get them a Have a Spark Sharky swimming board, believe the authors of this Kickstarter project. For $189, they offer a top speed of 3.4 miles per hour, an hour of operation on a single charge, and a weight of 10.4 pounds. The product is manufactured in China with an emphasis on quality and safety. You can even take the board on an airplane. In addition, the model is pretty resistant, making it suitable for some adults. During the test, it had no problems pulling up to 176 pounds. All systems are protected from water and sand, and you can control the swim with the LED display. And of course, the authors highlight the original shark design in yellow or blue. The shark from the previous clip seems interesting, but too modest in terms of performance. Archie O'Brien, a student at a British university, kilometers an hour while carrying up to five passengers. An even more impressive feat is that the bubble does this while producing no emissions that may be harmful to the environment or even any waves. It has two main modes which activate depending on the speed of the craft. The first is the Archimedean mode with the hull touching the water, which functions while the speed is between 0 to 6 knots, and the foiling mode in which only the foils touch the water, where it powers along at about 40 centimeters above the water when the speed is between 7 to 18 knots. All passengers need to do is enter into the bubble, strap up, and enjoy the ride. Fly Ride the chair is made of polyethylene on a fiberglass frame, and its dimensions are 8.2 by 7.4 feet. The passengers can enjoy two comfortable ergonomic sun lounges, which allow them to sit in a chair with all the comfort in full growth, and, if necessary, without any problems, slip into the water if they want to swim. Thanks to the special handles located on the sides of the boat, it'll be easy for a person to climb back in. The creators also provided protection from the sun, for this purpose, over the seats there's an unusual construction, reminiscent of three palm leaves or petals of large tropical flowers. Their position is easy to change depending on the solar activity and the owner's preferences. The electric motor installed in the device can work up to six hours without recharging. The speed and direction of the boat are regulated using a trackball, which is as easy to operate as a conventional joystick. Among other things, the chair boat is equipped with all the necessary attributes of a comfortable rest. For example, a compact bottle cooler, cup holders, and a sound system that can play music from your smartphone via Bluetooth. The audio system is controlled via a small onboard computer, which also informs you about the level of battery power of the device, the boat's speed, and other necessary things. Depending on the configuration, the boat can be equipped with additional illumination. Helicat. This is a boat for those who are afraid to fly, but very fond of spending time near the water. It looks like an unusual hybrid of a catamaran and a helicopter, and is literally known as the Helicopter Cat. But the creators pursued not only the goal to draw attention to their device due to its unusual appearance, 
This catamaran is positioned as a very fast vehicle, which remains stable even in troubled waters. The cab was designed for three people, but if necessary, it can accommodate seven people, including the pilot. The design of the cabin prevents water from getting inside, even during a storm, with the help of special vinyl curtains, which can be this season of darkness in America. We'll choose hope over fear, facts over fiction, fairness over privilege. I'm a proud Democrat, and I'll be proud to carry the banner of our party into the general election. So it's with great honor and humility, I accept this nomination for President of the United States of America. But while I'll be a Democratic candidate, I will be an American president. I'll work hard for those who didn't support me, as hard for them as I did for those who did vote for me. That's the job of a president, to represent all of us, not just our base or our party. This is not a partisan moment. This must be an American moment. It's a moment that calls for hope and light and love, hope for our future, light to see our way forward and love for one another. America isn't just a collection of clashing interests of red states or blue states. We're so much bigger than that. We're so much better than that. You know, nearly a century ago, Franklin Roosevelt pledged a new deal in a time of massive unemployment, uncertainty, and fear. Stricken by a disease, stricken by a virus, FDR insisted that he would recover and prevail, and he believed America could as well. And he did, and we can as well. This campaign isn't just about winning votes. It's about winning the heart and, yes, the soul of America. Winning it for the generous among us, not the selfish. Winning it for workers who keep this country going, not just the privileged few at the top. Winning it for those communities who have known the injustice of a knee on the neck. For all the young people who have known only America being in rising inequity and shrinking opportunity, they deserve the experience of America's promise. They deserve to experience it in full. You know, no generation ever knows what history will ask of it. All we can ever know In my never-ending pursuit to find the nicest motor coaches in the world, we struck gold today and we found Frank from Liberty Coach. How you doing today, sir? Great. How you doing? Excellent. Thank you. This is a beautiful triple slide Liberty Coach, unlike anything I've ever seen. What's going on, sir? Well, this is a brand new, hot off the factory press, just got here last week, 2022 Liberty H345 triple slide with two super slides in the back of the coach. 
It's got a new interior design to it as well, some new features that we just came out with. It's pretty exciting. I've heard a lot of people say Liberty Coach is the finest motor coach in the world. What separates you guys from any other motor coaches out there? Well, Andrew, uh, next year we're going to be going into our 50th anniversary. Uh, we're a family-owned company. We have been from the beginning when my parents started it, and we have been transitioning through the years, starting with the old Greyhound buses that we used to do the interiors on to being the first company to do the Prevo uh, motorhome chassis uh, in 1978 to where we are today we continually set the benchmark over 10 years now uh, using the lithium uh, battery systems yep we're over 10 years now with using the lithium ion battery system we're actually going into our 11th year actually 12 years we're going into uh, also our paint schemes which I know you saw when you walked in here this will be 10 years with doing the paint jobs with Dean Laux and the art of design. So there's a number of aspects about us that take us well, well above everybody else. What's some of the other things that separate you guys from everyone else in the industry? Well, it's our fit and finish for sure. The amount of time that we spend in the interior of the coach. Uh, my brother, Kurt, and his wife, Kim, do a phenomenal job on the interior aspects of the coach. Kurt runs the manufacturing facility. His ability to design the floor plans and the cabinet layouts to utilize every, every inch, every millimeter of space that can be for storage and usability is uncanny in the industry. Our technological investments, which you had said before with the lithium ion battery system that we're using uh, from Volta, the 58 volt system, to our custom cockpit installation, to our furniture manufacturing that we do, every aspect of it really is, is above and beyond. Yes, sir, and I still can't believe I got you to say it this morning, but is it really true that this coach has a lifetime warranty on squeaks and rattles to the original owner? So our lifetime warranty covers our new coaches to the original owner on our workmanship as, well, as far as what we do from if you've got a, a, a tank that starts leaking, that's our problem, we built it, to if it's a component that we installed and our installation caused a component failure, that's our problem, to squeaks and rattles for as long as a customer owns it. We did that for Charlie Daniels. Uh, unfortunately, we lost him last year, but his coach had two and a half million miles on it that we delivered in May of 1994, and we still handled squeaks and rattles if they ever came up. All the way to the end he used yep. that bus, yes See sir. You. Well that's really a testament and I'm really excited to take a closer look at this coach. Do you mind if we take a look at the bays before Absolutely. we go inside? Absolutely. The first bay is going to have two slide out trays. These slide out trays we manufacture in house at Liberty Coach. They are the lowest profile in the industry to give you the most amount of storage. Uh, we have a tool drawer here nice dividers that can be set any way that you want to. We've got storage drawers here above. Everything as you can see is finished. It looks like it was always supposed to be that way. Finished in carpet, finished in the carbon fiber uh, laminate as well. Going to the next bay here. Again we have a slide out tray manufactured by Liberty Coach. More storage drawers here. Up above we have the uh, sound processor system for our 65 inch pull out TV. This system is manufactured by Liberty Coach in house with the sound bar below. Yeah, really smooth and effortless when you pulled that out. You know, there was no resistance. Uh, it was very effortless. And you take a look inside of the compartment where this goes, it's completely finished as well. We have a spot for the, uh, the grill unit, the Kenyan grill. Restaurant panel down here for operation of the entire coach as well as a handheld remote control we have, refrigerator, storage drawers, lighting underneath. These lights are exclusive to Liberty Coach. They're a bronze 
naval bronze casting that is chrome plated. It has a uh, the testing on it was an 18 year salt spray to make sure that they would not corrode in the harshest environments. Another storage aspect here. Yeah, and when you're opening and closing that, I've got to point out, you know, even the sides of these basement compartment doors still have the fades and the ghosting Absolutely. in them. All of the same detail work that you see in the rest of the paint scheme continues all well, the way. Well, you feel even around the whole door, it's all finished. There's no sharp, everything has to be done that way. That is a testament to Dean and how we like to have our coaches finished off. We have fuel fill here on the passenger side as well as the driver's side, def fuel on, fill on the other. Capacity on our coach here for fuel is 238 gallons. I believe that's the most in the industry for the entire industry the Prevo chassis has. Um, and we've got about 16 liter of uh, def capacity as well. And that'll take you for about two and a half uh, diesel fuel tank top offs, if you will. Yes, sir. Fresh water compartment here. All finished off, hot and cold faucet. We've got a 40 gallon water heater. That's twice as big as anybody else in the industry. We have a tankless water heater to, that goes specifically to the shower. So in case the water would, you'd run out of hot water, which would be kind of tough to do, you have the ability to have hot water to the shower if need be. And then you have the reverse osmosis filtration system, which goes to the water dispenser and ice maker at the refrigerator. Stainless steel fresh water tank, which is about 175 gallon capacity, and an aluminum holding tank, which is the, about the same capacity. And we do the black and gray water in the same tank, which keeps the tank cleaner, keeps the odors down as well. And you have the ability to bypass the gray water from the tank out the bottom of the coach into a separate drain if you have the ability to do that to give you more capacity on the black side. Yes, sir. I want to take a look at how these Prevo slides are finished, all radius, no sharp corners, no sharp edges to bang your head on to split yourself open <laughs> like we've done in the past yes, on other sir. coaches for sure, right? Yeah, and I'm just really impressed with the depth of this paint job as we walk around. But yeah, you can see the different ghosting aspects in it here and here. Yeah, and there's just but different you patterns. Even look at how it's even finished where the window closes off. Yeah, I mean, I've never noticed that. Closed, the, the paint goes through there as well. That's the first time I've ever noticed that, and, and really a testament. Nobody else that I've ever seen finishes up inside the window but also it's got the perforated vinyl. And that's, I, that's a painted vinyl. Yeah, I've, yeah painted vinyl, yes painted sir. Vinyl. Yeah, so, so it matches perfectly. Yeah, yeah, Dean's talked about that, how they exactly use the same exact paint colors to paint that vinyl. Really gives it an incredible look from uh, five or 10 feet away here. As you notice these devices on the side of the coach, there's three of them down the side from the front, somewhat center area to the back. This is, Liberty Coach's exclusive blind spot detection system that we brought in on the 21 model coaches. So what this does is it's a radar system that is not affected by snow, rain, any of the debris out there that gives you a the ability for the driver to see via indicators on the uh, driver and passenger side windshield posts of a vehicle coming alongside the coach. So this works actually back as far as your tow vehicle, you'll be able to signal something there all the way up to the front door or the driver's window. Again, something else that we enhance the safety features of the Prevo chassis. Over and above what Prevo does as well with their new uh, driver uh, uh, assist program, which has lane departure, it has collision alert on a heads up display, and the advanced uh, cruise adaptive cruise control system that they have. So we've added all of th this feature on top of what they have as well. So we believe we have by far the safest and uh, 
easiest driver intuitive vehicle to go down the road. Yeah, and uh, that's all powered by the Volvo D13. How long is, uh, have you guys been using the Volvo D13? So the D13 engine came into play about mid 2012 model year for Liberty Coach, and we've been using it since then. By far, it was e the easiest and smoothest engine transition that we'd had in all the years with dealing with Prevo. Even the uh, Detroit to Detroit has it had its own characteristic issues that went on, but to go from what we had on the Series 60 to the Volvo D13 was almost seamless. And that's a 500 horse engine with 1,750 foot-pounds of torque. Yeah, and uh, Volvo is a huge company. Uh, a lot of people that don't know, Volvo owns Prevo. So as far as you know, getting these serviced, uh, what's the availability of Prevo service centers or where can folks go? They're everywhere. I mean, you can go on the Prevo Motorhome website and you can see all of the service locations throughout the country. The major ones are going to be uh, we have in Winter Garden, Florida, you are over in the Dallas, Texas area, you have Mira Loma, California, you have Houston, you've got Chicago. Uh, of course, you've got Quebec, and they've got a couple of centers that are up in the northwest as well. Okay. But there, you can go to a Volvo service center also and get the Prevo chassis uh, worked on as well. Yeah, and uh, Liberty Coach, as far as on the house side, you have your location here in Stewart, Florida, and uh, factory in Chicago as well? The factory is in the town of North Chicago, Illinois. You know, and with that, you have to look at how the chassis is built. So, you know, you don't need as much service as you might think for people that have the Class A motorhome and they've got problems that they need to go here, there, throughout the country to do it. They're, they're wanting to know about that because of the problems that they've had. At this level, we just don't see those type of problems. You're looking at a chassis that's built to do two and a half, three million miles. The book shows this. We've got a racist running against me and you guys are running cover for her. She tried to bribe Talonia Adams out of not speaking to the press. And that, co that story didn't get any coverage by you guys. I never saw a headline on that. Let me tell you, if the roles were reversed and I had this hideous of a background, you guys would be covering it nonstop. Shame on you for not covering Katie Hobbs the way she is. Katie Hobbs obviously hates people of color. Her past proves that. Why are you not covering that story? Why? I'm asking for the people of Arizona. She's against families being able to take their kids to a better school. This hurts our minority communities. Every student in this state deserves to have the best education. And with ESA for All, they will be able to get that. Katie Hobbs fought that. She, voting, she has a voting record that supported the rioters who burned down our cities and communities. Her voting record shows she opposed a border wall she opposed a virtual border wall. She was opposed to asking the federal government to reimburse Arizona for the cost of our open border. And she's voted against the border strike task force. What is wrong with this woman? She's working against the people of Arizona. She wants to defund the police. She's voted to double our gas tax from 18 cents to 36 cents. She put out a plan to help us with inflation that is a joke, and I noticed it got wall-to-wall -wall coverage from you guys. She wants to lower taxes on a few items, diapers and feminine hygiene products. And that got a lot of coverage from you. We are planning to cut all of the food tax and cut all of the rent tax to help all Arizonans. We're gonna be sending a half a billion dollars back into the pockets of hardworking Arizonans. I'm not sure that that got much coverage, but I think it's about time you start doing your job covering who this woman is. She's a coward who has no chance to, to be a great governor in this state. And I don't think she's gonna win. So if you have any questions about this, I'm hoping that you don't um, put the same headlines that I've seen already. We had nothing to do with this getting canceled. This was completely PBS, and it is outrageous that we're watching the decimation of a two-decade tradition of debates that help the voters decide who to vote for. And a coward named Katie Hobbs is behind it along with PBS. It's outrageous. Questions, anybody?
Jordan. We saw an undercover journalism expose done by Project Veritas where Katie Hobbs ran from reporters again. She also, you know, she admitted to lying to an Uber driver, somebody that actually works for her, pays her taxes, and she wouldn't tell him what she does for a living or the fact that she's running for governor. What does that tell you about her, her confidence in her campaign and also her ethical standards? Well, I don't know much. I haven't done a lot of research. I talked about the Project Veritas story that came out. All I saw was that she is running from a black reporter, which doesn't surprise me, spilling her food and drink all over and hiding in the bathroom. Surprises me not. This woman is a, is a maniac. I, don't, I really, I'm shocked at, at the level of racism I've seen. Uh, you know, I, I can't tell you what's going on in her mind and why she lied to the Uber driver. It's interesting the Uber driver didn't even know who she is. I do, I, I, I'm not shocked by that. She's been hiding in her basement. I think if she walked through here, half the people wouldn't know who she is. She's been in hiding, and she refuses to actually campaign across the state. Meantime, I'm campaigning across the state. According to Forbes, Elon Musk, the CEO and founder of Tesla and SpaceX, is the most innovative person in the world for the second consecutive time. And that is very clear of the unbelievable success he has achieved in business. Ten years ago, people considered him a reckless man with extravagant ideas. In 2008, his company Tesla collapsed during the financial crisis. Now Tesla is one of the most successful niche car companies in producing electric cars, all due to the fact that Elon Musk persevered and was determined. He has done what he thought to be impossible 10 years ago. But he has no plans of stopping soon. He has many innovative and wild plans for the future of mankind, which would improve the quality of our lives. Elon Musk believes that day by day, technology is only getting better and better. 
things are developing so fast that the future might be filled with exponential tech advances that would change the world. In the future, we will have video games so realistic that it would be difficult for us to tell the difference between games and reality. From self-driving tunnel networks to brain-controlled computers, we're going to look at how Elon Musk and his technology will take us forward and create the city of the future. Elon says that we always want the future to be better than the past. A future that is exciting and one that the people would want to live in. A few decades ago, a lot of technological advances seemed unimaginable, but today they are our new normal. Life without them is unimaginable. So let's look at what Elon Musk's city of the future would look like. So how will we get from one city to another in Elon's future city? It's hard to imagine being able to fly from New York City to Shanghai in 39 minutes, or from Sydney to London in an hour. But this is something that Elon and SpaceX are working on. Elon compares space rockets to airplanes, saying that if you do not reuse a plane, it would cost up to $250 million to fly one way. But because we can reuse them tens of thousands of times, it becomes affordable. The same is true for space rockets. A SpaceX rocket cost about $57 million, and if the rocket is reused a thousand times, it nearly costs $57,000 per flight. And by carrying people, we can get the price of a rocket flight down to the price of an economy flight ticket. The Starship rocket is being developed to take people to Mars. It can also transport people from city to city. In a 2017 interview, Elon said that he is working for this to become a reality in the next 10 years. And if you can carry people, you can also carry cargo, which means a super fast delivery for people. Another way of getting packages fast from one part of the country to another will be by electric semi-trucks being developed by Tesla. These semi-trucks require a driver, but in the future we will see entirely driverless versions of these and making deliveries and making transportation cheaper. Also, these trucks will be good for the environment because 25% of greenhouse gases come from the trucking industry. Though these ideas seem far-fetched, Elon has planned to make them possible in the next 10 to 12 years. There is yet another way that Elon plans to develop, and that is transportation via Hyperloop. Elon Musk asks that when you think about a new transportation system, what would you want ideally? You'll want something that would cost half the price to travel, would be twice as fast, cannot crash, and immune to weather. To make this possible, Elon is working on the idea of Hyperloop, which will take about 12 minutes to travel from Dubai to Abu Dhabi, and will also be powered by solar panels. There will be Hyperloop stations inside cities, making it easier and faster to travel. There are several Hyperloop routes being planned, and in Elon's future, they will be a major subject of attraction. Elon is constantly coming up with new ideas and innovative technologies that are astonishing. Apart from the ideas discussed above, let's inspect Elon's futuristic city. Most people would imagine a future city to be full of flying cars and drones with state-of-the-art technology, but Elon differs with this vision. In a TED interview, when he was asked about his vision for an exciting future, he rejected the idea of flying cars and drones, saying no one would like to see cars flying over us and creating all kinds of disturbances. Elon is right in many ways. He said that one of the most soul-destroying things is the traffic, and if there is traffic in the air or cars that would block the view of the sky, would be affected by weather and many other factors, that would not be an ideal future city you would want. To counter this traffic problem that takes away so much of our lives, he has planned to build a 3D network of tunnels. For this, he has founded a company named The Boring Company that would carry on the construction of tunnels. He believes the solution to urban traffic is the network of tunnels that go deeper under the cities. He says since you can always go deeper than you can go upwards, that the deepest mines are deeper than the tallest buildings. So we can have a network of tunnels that could go 20, 30, or 40 levels deep, where cars could go up to 200 kilometers an hour as railings guide the car and your autopilot takes over when you enter the tunnel. But creating a tunnel is a slow and expensive process and will require the process of digging tunnels to be cheap than they are currently. The Boring Company is working on to make this a possibility with a new tunnel digger. Elon says that the first thing that needs to be done 
is to cut down the tunnel size. Tunnels today need to be large, allowing for crashes, emergency, and ventilation for gas-powered vehicles. Using self-driving electric cars that will shrink the size of tunnels can eliminate this. To make the digging process efficient, we need to build a faster digger, one that can dig and reinforce the tunnel at the same time. This idea of building tunnels is safe and also one that would allow people to live peacefully. A trip from Westwood to LAX Airport, which takes 30 minutes, can increase because of traffic. Will only take 5 to 6 minutes in a boring company tunnel. Elon says that in the coming 10 to 12 years, it will be unusual for cars to be built that are not fully self-driving, as they are getting close to being 100 to 200% safer than a human driver. He says getting into a car would be just like getting into an elevator today and pushing a button. Electric cars are possible today because of the falling prices of the lithium-ion batteries. Batteries are what Tesla's main expertise is. Tesla is building gigafactories, which make lithium-ion batteries, along with other parts for Tesla cars. Elon believes it would take a total of 100 gigafactories to give humanity enough battery capacity to go fully renewable. Currently, there are two gigafactories in the United States and one in China. Tesla has announced plans for another gigafactory in Germany. As our cities and lives would become electrified, everything will also be connected. This will be made possible by Starlink, a project by SpaceX which aims to launch nearly 12,000 satellites in orbit which will provide internet all across the world and even in places where people don't have internet today. SpaceX launched the first batch of these satellites in May of 2019, which Elon, in his very Elon Musk, announced by posting a tweet using these satellites. As of when this video is out, SpaceX has launched about 750. Week, which was referenced does indicate that your company has a bank account in China. So how can voters know that you don't have any foreign conflict of interest? I have many bank accounts and they're all listed and they're all over the place. I mean, I was a businessman doing business. The bank account you're referring to, which is everybody knows about it, it's listed. The bank account was in 2013. That's what it was. It was opened and do it was closed in 2015, I believe. And then I decided, because I was going to do, I was thinking about doing a deal in China, like millions of other people, I was thinking about it, and I decided I'm not going to do it, didn't like it, I decided not to do it, had an account open, and I closed it. Okay. Excuse me. And then, unlike him, where he's vice president and he does business, I then decided to run for president after that. That was before. So I closed it before I even ran for president, let alone became president. Big difference. He is the vice president of the United States, and his son, his brother, and his other brother are getting rich. They're like a vacuum cleaner. They're sucking okay, up president money. Okay, President Trump, place thank you. We do Not need to true. move on. I do want to ask you, uh, Vice President Biden, about China. Let's talk about China more broadly. There have, of course, President Trump has said that they should pay for not being fully transparent in regards to the coronavirus. If you were president, would you make China pay? And please be specific, what would that look like? What I'd make China do is play by the international rules, not like he has done. He has caused the deficit of China to go up, not down, with China, up, not down. We are making sure that in order to do business in China, you have to give all your intellectual
カービー氏によりますと北朝鮮からの相当な数の砲弾は中東や北アフリカの国々を迂回し最終目的地がロシアであることを特定しにくくしているとしていますその上でロシアが最終的に受け取ったかどうか引き続き監視していくとしていますまたカービー氏はロシアは兵器不足と制裁の影響で北朝鮮やイランのような国々と協力しなければならない状況だと指摘しています一方で北朝鮮からロシアへの砲弾の供与が戦争の方向性を変えるものにはならないとの見方も示しています than at any time in the history of this country. So they obviously think I'm going to win. They obviously think we're going to win. 
And they want to make us happy, but we're not happy, because that should have been stopped. And it's not here all over the world. You see what's going on in Europe. It's so sad. But you see what's going on. 188 countries all over the world. What China has done to this world, what they've done, people come up to me, they're clothed in masks and stuff and this. Hello, President. Hello. I said, look, look at this. What China has done to our country, what China, what, it, I may do that. You better be careful. What China has done to this country, what, it's not the first time either. Well, they're paying. They're paying. But you can never pay for 200,000 more lives. You can never pay for that. Yeah, we can, we can make them pay plenty. But uh, 210,000 lives. But it would have been 2 million lives. It's incredible the job that we've done and that the American people have done. This could have been 2 million lives. He said 2.2 million lives. No, they're going to pay. We believe in safe streets, secure communities, and we believe in law and order, not like in Philadelphia. And they can't let that happen. They can't let the looters run wild. They can't do it. You can't. You either have law and order or you don't. Philadelphia can't do what they're doing. And they have good police in Philadelphia. They like Trump, I can tell you. I've, got, I've been endorsed by every law enforcement group. New York's finest. They endorsed me. They've never endorsed a presidential candidate. New York's finest endorsed me. It was a great honor, because I grew up with New York's finest. They're, then they are. They're incredible people. They're not being allowed to do their job. They've been way — he cut back a billion dollars he took back, and now crime is way up. That's not even the money. They're not being allowed. They're incredible people. Tough as hell, fair. They love our country. They're not being allowed in New York to do our job between the governor and the mayor. They're being just absolutely — and they want to leave. They want to get out. They have plenty of other opportunity. They don't need the danger. It's a dangerous job for all police. But we've been endorsed by New York. We were endorsed by Chicago police. The Chicago police, that's tough. We've been endorsed by all of you sheriffs. You have sheriffs. You have great, tough sheriffs. I know many of them, but the sheriffs — we had a big ceremony two months ago in Florida. Ron was there. You were endorsed. We got endorsed by the sheriffs, all law enforcement all over Florida. And I asked Sleepy Joe at the debate, I said, Joe, name one law enforcement agency, just one in the whole country that endorsed you. He couldn't do it, remember? Then Chris Wallace saved him. I had two people. I was, I was going against Chris Wallace and him. Uh, Chris, Chris was much tougher, actually. Chris was tougher than Joe. And then I said, Joe, say the words law and order. No. Say the words law and order, Joe. Say them. And then Chris Wallace, he doesn't have to do that. Oh, okay, Chris, thanks. <laughs> now, I like Chris's father a lot better than I like him, Mike Wallace, the great Mike Wallace. You know, he did me on 60 Minutes. It was a great, it was one of the few good pieces. You know, he was a tough guy. Chris tries to be like him, but he doesn't have what it takes. But Mike Wallace. Well, Mr. Prime Minister, I am absolutely honored to get to speak with you. Uh, here in America, we love you. We have prayed for you for many, many years. I uh, almost felt like reading your book that I was reading from the scriptures. And there, I, 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 the, here's the reason, because when you read the scriptures, you read miracles that God did for his people. And I read miracle after miracle after miracle that God did uh, through you, and uh, obviously, I know after reading your book, you would deflect that praise to many other people as well. But that God did for His people, and uh, I have to tell you, from the very first word, in uh, absorbing the ovation of the Congress assembled there, and he now gets ready to deliver his second State of the Union. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker, Mr. Vice President, members of Congress, the First Lady of the United States,
and my fellow Americans. We meet tonight at a moment of unlimited potential. As we begin a new Congress, I stand here ready to work with you to achieve historic breakthroughs for all Americans. Millions of our fellow citizens are watching us now gathered in this great chamber, hoping that we will govern not as two parties, but as one nation. The agenda I will lay out this evening is not a Republican agenda or a Democrat agenda. It's the agenda of the American people. Many of us have campaigned on the same core promises to defend American jobs and demand fair trade for American workers, to rebuild and revitalize our nation's infrastructure, to reduce the price of health care and prescription drugs, to create an immigration system that is safe, lawful, modern, and secure, and to pursue a foreign policy that puts America's interest first. There is a new opportunity in American politics if only we have the courage together to seize it. Victory is not winning for our party. Victory is winning for our country. This year, America will recognize two important anniversaries that show us the majesty of America's mission and the power of American pride. In June, we mark 75 years since the start of what General Dwight D. Eisenhower called the Great Crusade, the Allied liberation of Europe in World War II. On D-Day, June 6, 1944, 15,000 young American men jumped from the sky, and 60,000 more stormed in from the sea to save our civilization from tyranny. Here with us tonight are three of those incredible heroes. Private First Class Joseph Riley, Staff Sergeant Irving Locker, and Sergeant Herman. Snowden, used against Julian Assange, um, used against Daniel Ellsberg, obviously, famously for the Pentagon Papers. Uh, so when they go back and look at these different examples, Daniel Ellsberg, for example, the Pentagon Papers, the Washington Post, are like, oh, look at this great thing that was done. And yet we fast forward a few years to the Obama administration, where more than any other president, he prosecuted people, charged and prosecuted people under the Espionage Act. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? What is wrong with the Espionage Act and how it's being abused and uh, how it can be fixed, if it can be? See, I have trouble separating... 
How would you like to wake up surrounded by natural beauty and amazing views that you can change whenever you want? Those are just some of the many benefits of owning a modern luxury houseboat. Not convinced? Try taking a look at some of the Funding for this PBS election special is provided by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and viewers like you. Thank you. I know more about ISIS than the generals do, believe me. I have sat at that table in the Situation Room. Nobody knows the system better than me. I alone can fix it. I'm going to close my campaign focused on opportunities for kids and fairness for families. Hillary failed on the economy. Everything she touched didn't work out. Nothing. Even if you're totally opposed to Donald Trump, you may still have some questions about me. Good evening. I'm Judy Woodruff. Gwen Ifill is away tonight. Welcome to this PBS NewsHour special coverage of the final presidential debate between Democrat Hillary Clinton and Republican Donald Trump. The stage is set at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, at a time when the most recent polls, both national and in battleground states, show a surge in support for Clinton. While Trump's numbers have been slipping, especially since the release of a 2005 video where he's heard using lewd language, boasting about being sexually aggressive. The debate moderator, Chris Wallace of Fox News, announced ahead of time that there will be six topics tonight, not necessarily in this order, debt and entitlements, immigration, the economy, the Supreme Court, foreign hotspots, and fitness to be president. To watch it all, joining me here at this table in Washington are our regular NewsHour contributors, syndicated columnist Mark Shields, New York Times columnist David Brooks, and Amy Walter of the Cook Political Report. So we're at the third one, and it'll all be over after this one. David, <laughs> do you expect them to go high or low? <laughs> uh, you promise it'll be over? Uh, <laughs> no, I expect uh, her to go high, him to go low. <laughs> uh, I mean, he's behind, and so he's got to try some desperate move and the trick for her will be to see if she can be strong enough to rebut whatever he says while still projecting some sense of positivity that will attract some people to her. My big question though for the country is do we want to take a shower after this is over? Do we feel better about our country or worse? Low or high, Mark? Um, I think <clears throat> Donald Trump uh, won the nomination going away and prevailed in the debates by uh, exposing and playing to the vulnerabilities and perceived weaknesses of his opponents. He has to have concluded after, and he, he rattled them, uh, and he bullied them. And he has to conclude after two debates that that hasn't worked with Hillary Clinton. After 26 debates with Barack Obama, she's far, far more formidable than anybody he faced in the Republican primaries. And I don't know, I, I think he's just going to throw everything today. And, so and maybe, that's the challenge for the third debate. To. Your mom always told you you never get a second chance to make a good first impression. His first debate performance, I think, in many ways sealed the fate of his entire candidacy. Now, he can try to come back in this third debate and go after Hillary Clinton more aggressively, but I don't know that that's going to make much of a difference. Although this is what a Republican strategist told me he needs to do tonight. He just put in all caps, emails, foundation, failed record, emails, foundation, failed record, emails, foundation, failed record. That's, and I think, what you're going to hear from Donald Trump. Good evening Trump. from the Thomas and Mack Center at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. I'm Chris Wallace of Fox News. And I welcome you to the third and final of the 2016 presidential debates between Secretary of State Hillary Clinton and Donald J. Trump. This debate is sponsored by the Commission on Presidential Debates. The Commission has designed the format, six roughly 15-minute segments with two-minute answers to the first question, then open discussion for the rest of each segment. Both campaigns have agreed to those rules. For the record, I decided the topics and the questions in each topic. None of those questions has been shared with the commission or the two candidates. The audience here in the hall has promised to remain silent. No cheers, boos, or other interruptions so we and you can focus on what the candidates have to say. No noise except right now. 
as we welcome the Democratic nominee for president, Secretary Clinton, and the Republican nominee for president, Mr. Trump. Secretary Clinton, Mr. Trump, welcome. Let's get right to it. The first topic is the Supreme Court. We, you both talked briefly about the court in the last debate, but I want to drill down on this because the next president will almost certainly have at least one appointment and likely or possibly two or three appointments, which means that you will, in effect, determine the balance of the court for what could be the next quarter century. First of all, where do you want to see the court take the country? And secondly, what's your view on how the Constitution should be interpreted? Is, do the founders' words mean what they say, or is it a living document <clears throat> to be applied flexibly according to changing circumstances? In this segment, Secretary Clinton, you go first. You have two minutes. Thank you very much, Chris, and thanks to UNLV for hosting us. You know, I think when we talk about the Supreme Court, it really raises the central issue in this election. Namely, what kind of country are we going to be? What kind of opportunities will we provide for our citizens? What kind of rights will Americans have? And I feel strongly that the Supreme Court needs to stand on the side of the American people, not on the side of the powerful corporations and the wealthy. For me, that means that we need a Supreme Court that will stand up on behalf of women's rights, on behalf of the rights of the LGBT community, that will stand up and say no to Citizens United, a decision that has undermined the uh, election system in our country because of the way it permits dark, unaccountable money to come into uh, our electoral system. I have major disagreements with my opponent about these issues and others that will be before the Supreme Court. But I feel that at this point in our country's history, uh, it is important that we not reverse marriage equality, that we not reverse Roe v. Wade, that we stand up against Citizens United, we stand up for the rights of people in the workplace, that we stand up and basically say, the Supreme Court should represent all of us. That's how I see the court and the kind of people that I would be looking to uh, nominate to the court uh, would be in the great tradition of standing up to the powerful, standing up on behalf of our rights as Americans. And I look forward to having that opportunity. I would hope that the Senate would do its job and confirm the nominee that President Obama has sent to them. That's the way the Constitution fundamentally should operate. The president nominates, and then the Senate advises and consents or not, but they go forward with the process. Secretary Clinton, thank you. Mr. Trump, same question. Where do you want to see the court take the country, and how do you believe the Constitution should be interpreted? Well, first of all, it's uh, great to be with you, and thank you, everybody. The Supreme Court, it's what it's all about. Our country is so, so, it's just so imperative that we have the right justices. Something happened recently where Justice Ginsburg uh, made some very, very inappropriate statements toward me and toward a tremendous number of people, many, many millions of people that I represent. And she was forced to apologize, and apologize she did. But these were statements that should never, ever have been made. We need a Supreme Court that, in my opinion, is going to uphold the Second Amendment and all amendments, but the Second Amendment which is under absolute siege. Uh, I believe if my opponent should win this race, which I truly don't think will happen, uh, we will have a Second Amendment, which will be a very, very small replica of what it is right now. But I feel that it's absolutely important that we uphold because of the fact that it is under such uh, trauma. Uh, I feel that the uh, justices that I am going to appoint, and I've named 20 of them, the justices that I'm going to appoint will be pro-life. They will have a conservative bent. Uh, they will be protecting the Second Amendment. They are great scholars in all cases, and they are people of tremendous respect. Uh, they will interpret the Constitution the way 
the founders wanted it interpreted. And I believe that's very, very important. I don't think we should have justices appointed that decide what they want to hear. It's all about the Constitution of, of and, and so important, the Constitution the way it was meant to be. And those are the people that I will appoint. Mr. Trump, thank you. We now have about 10 minutes for an open discussion. I want to focus on two issues that, in fact, by the justices that you name, could end up changing the existing law of the land. First is one that you mentioned, Mr. Trump, and that is guns. Secretary Clinton, you said last year, and let me quote, the Supreme Court is wrong on the Second Amendment. And now, in fact, in the 2008 Heller case, the court ruled that there is a constitutional right to bear arms, but a, a right that is reasonably limited. Those were the words of the, uh, of the judge, Antonin Scalia, who wrote the decision. What's wrong with that? Well, first of all, I support the Second Amendment. I lived in Arkansas for 18 wonderful years. I represented upstate New York. I understand and respect the tradition of gun ownership. It goes back to the founding of our country. Uh, but I also believe that there can be and must be reasonable regulation. Um, because I support the Second Amendment doesn't mean that I want people who shouldn't have guns to be able to threaten you, kill you or members of your family. And so when I think about what we need to do, we have 33,000 people a year who die from guns. I think we need comprehensive background checks, need to close the online loophole, close the uh, gun show loophole. There's other matters that I think are sensible, that are the kind of reforms that would make a difference, that are not in any way conflicting with the Second Amendment. You mentioned the Heller decision, and what I was saying uh, that you referenced, Chris, was that I disagreed with the way the court applied the Second Amendment in that case, because what the District of Columbia was trying to do was to protect toddlers from guns. And so they wanted people with guns to safely store them. And the court didn't accept that reasonable regulation, but they've accepted many others. So I see no conflict between saving people's lives and defending the Second Amendment. Let, let me bring Mr. Trump in here. The bipartisan open debate coalition uh, got millions of votes on questions to ask here. And this was, in fact, one of the top questions that uh, they got. How will you ensure the Second Amendment is protected? You just heard Secretary Clinton's answer. Does she persuade you that while you may disagree on regulation, that in fact she supports a Second Amendment right to bear arms? Well, the D.C. versus Heller decision uh, was very strongly, and she was extremely angry about it. I watched. I mean, she was very, very angry when upheld. And uh, Justice Scalia was uh, so involved, and it was a well-crafted decision. But Hillary was extremely upset, extremely angry, and people that believe in the Second Amendment and believe in it very strongly were very upset with what she had to say. Well, let me, let me bring in Secretary Clinton. <laughs> were you extremely upset? Well, I was upset because, unfortunately, dozens of toddlers uh, injure themselves, even kill people with guns, because, unfortunately, not everyone who um, has loaded guns in their homes takes appropriate precautions. But there's no doubt that I respect the Second Amendment, that I also believe there's an individual right to bear arms. That is not in conflict with sensible, common-sense regulation. And, you know, look, I understand that Donald's been uh, strongly supported by the NRA. The gun lobby's on his side. They're running millions of dollars of ads against me. And I regret that, because what I would like to see is for people to come together and say, of course, we're going to protect and defend the Second Amendment, but we're going to do it in a way that tries to save some of these 33,000 lives that we lose every well, year. Let me bring Mr. Trump back into that, because, in fact, you oppose any limits on assault weapons, any limits on high-capacity magazines. You support a national right-to-carry law. Why, sir? Well, let me just tell you, before we go any further, in Chicago, which has the toughest gun laws in the United States, probably you could say by far, they have more gun violence than any other city. So we have the toughest laws, and you have tremendous gun violence. I am a very strong supporter of the Second Amendment, and I am, I don't know if Hillary was saying it in a sarcastic manner, but I'm very proud to have the endorsement 
of the NRA, and it's the earliest endorsement they've ever given to anybody who ran for president. So I'm very honored by all of that. Uh, we are going to appoint justices. This is the best way to help the Second Amendment. We are going to appoint justices that will feel very strongly about the Second Amendment, that will not do damage to the Second Amendment. Well, let's pick up on another issue which divides you and the justices that whoever ends up winning this election appoints could have a dramatic effect that there, and that's the issue of abortion. Right. Mr. Trump, you're pro-life, but I, I want to ask you specifically, do you want the court, including the justices that you will name, to overturn Roe v. Wade, which includes, in fact states, a woman's right to abortion? Well, if that would happen, because I am pro-life and I will be appointing pro-life judges, I would think that that will go back to the individual states. But I'm asking you specifically, would you if like to... If they overturned it, it'll go back to the states. But what I'm asking you, sir, is do you want to see the court overturn? You just said you want to see the court protect the Second Amendment. Do you want to see the court overturn Roe v. Wade? Well, if we put another two or perhaps three justices on, that's really what's going to be... Ha that will happen. And that'll happen automatically, in my opinion, because I am putting pro-life justices on the court. I will say this. It will go back to the states and the states will then make a determination. Secretary Clinton. Well, I, I strongly support Roe v. Wade, which guarantees a constitutional right to a woman to make the most intimate, most difficult, in many cases, decisions about her health care that uh, one can imagine. And in this case, it's not only about Roe v. Wade. It is about what's happening right now in America. So many states are putting very stringent regulations on women that block them from exercising that choice to the extent that they are defunding Planned Parenthood, which, of course, provides all kinds of cancer. This device could instantly set the entire planet on fire. At least that was exactly what its makers were afraid of. But even despite these suspicions, on July 16th, 1945, they unleashed the nuclear demon. The first detonation of an atomic bomb named Trinity was so powerful that a huge fiery mushroom cloud higher than Everest rose above the New Mexico desert. And since the worst fears were not confirmed and all hell didn't break loose, humans decided that they tamed the nuclear demon. But that was only an illusion. In this video, you'll find out how did an underground explosion affect outer space? What atomic test was so powerful that it was dubbed a second Hiroshima? And most importantly, what nuclear test turned out to be exceptionally destructive to the great surprise of even military services? Bright and luminous Las Vegas dazzled its guests even 75 years ago. But just 100 kilometers away, there was the Nevada test site where flashes of light could literally make you go blind. Starting from the 50s, the military conducted around a thousand nuclear tests there. In 1957, they thought it was time to try something new, to blow up underground layers of Earth. As part of the Pascal A test, in a mine at a depth of 150 meters, they installed a bomb weighing just 29 kilograms and containing less than a kilogram of TNT. By military standards, that's a pretty small thing. Scientists expected that all the explosion energy would stay in the mine tunnel, but the nuclear demon wasn't going to be cooped up. A pillar of flame dozens of meters high burst out of the ground. It happened because, for some reason, the real power of the bomb was 55 tons. 
In other words, 50,000 times greater than the developers had predicted. That's like intending to celebrate the 4th of July by setting off a firecracker and watching it destroy the whole city. But even after such a vicious prank pulled by the nuclear genie, the military insisted on a retest that was called Pascal B. Only this time, the mine exit was sealed with an iron 90 kilogram cap. That one would definitely withstand any blast wave, no need to worry. That's what scientists thought, and they were wrong. The explosion struck the cap with a yield of 300 tons and knocked it out at an unbelievable speed of 66 kilometers per second. This is six times higher than the escape velocity of the Apollo program rockets launched a decade later. Actually, that cap could have become the first object to travel into space on behalf of the US in 1957. But of course, it just probably vanished into the atmosphere. Meanwhile, the released nuclear demon was only warming up on American soil. This piece of paradise is Bikini Atoll in the Marshall Islands, although only a madman would want to spend a vacation there in the late 40s. That's because the US military carried out almost two dozen devastating nuclear tests in this region. In July 1946, as a part of the Baker nuclear test, a fleet of 90 target ships was assembled off Bikini Atoll to study the consequences of an atomic blast at sea. The bomb was attached to the bottom of a landing ship and lowered to a depth of 27 meters. The explosive yield of three kilotons blew the ship into atoms and created a water column as high as two and a half Burj Khalifa towers. And when hundreds of tons of water collapsed down, they triggered a tsunami that claimed nine target ships. However, the rest of them were even less fortunate. The nuclear demon showered so much radiation on the remaining fleet that all the ships had to be sunk. But the military guys were rather excited. Six years later, on the neighboring Aniwataka Atoll, they built an evil device able to greatly increase the nuclear demon's power. They tested it on November 1, 1952. The test, codenamed Ivy Mike, released 10.5 megatons of destructive energy, which equals 400 Baker tests. That was the first American. ベルト。ビズ。10月末に取りまとめられた政府の総合経済対策。その決定の背景には自民党と財務省の駆け引きがありました。ある自民党幹部が財務省は地雷を踏んだと称した今回の攻防。その様子をお伝えします。こんにち
岸田総理に党としての提言書を手渡しました当面の暮らしや事業を支えるだけでなく少なくとも来年秋以降もしっかり見通せるようさらにはその先の力強い経済成長にも期待が持てるようにとの視点で経済対策を検討してまいりました総理からもですね規模、中身、いずれも大事だということを改めて確認をしたところですこの自民党の提言に基づいて党と政府が調整を行う政調全体会議が10月24日に行われましたただこの日はさらなる増額の要望など議員から政府への要求が多く出たこともあり結論は持ち越しに2回目の会議が行われたのはその2日後の26日でした本日は前回の会議を踏まえた修正案をもとに改めてご議論をいただきたいと思います南極を乗り越えるにふさわしい経済対策となるよう各位の一層の奮起をお願いしてご挨拶にしたいと思います自民党と政府の間でどういった対策が盛り込めるか調整が難航する中、萩生田政調会長に一本の電話が入りました。電話をかけてきたのは岸田総理だったといいます。財務省が与党と一致したと報告しに来たけど、政調会長は知っているの実は会議が行われていた午後2時30分、鈴木財務大臣をはじめとした財務省幹部が官邸に入り、岸田総理に経済対策について報告に行ったのです。そして岸田総理に、経済対策の規模は 25.1 兆円、与党とも合意は取れていると伝えたといいます。この報告を受け、岸田総理は先ほどの電話をかけ、状況を確認。萩生田政調会長はまだ中身を議論しているのに規模が決まるわけがないと返したといいます自民党と政府が調整を行っている最中にいわば抜け駆けを行った財務省ある党幹部はこの行動を財務省は地雷を踏んだと称しました実際会議に戻った萩生田氏が総理との電話について明かしたことで一部議員から党を軽視していると声が上がり議論は紛糾さらなる増額を求める声も相次いだといいますその日の夜には党の意向を組む形で岸田総理が鈴木財務大臣に直接増額を指示その結果物価高克服、えー、経済再生実現のための総合経済対策については、与党の皆様方において精力的にご検討いただき、えー、本日、力強い政策を、えー、対策をまとめることができました。補正予算の一般会計歳出は 29.1 兆円となっています。えー、今後、補正予算を速や,速やかに編成し、できる限り早期に成立を目指します4兆円の増額を自民党はもぎ取ったのです増額のきっかけとなったのは財務省の行動だけではありません実は萩生田政調会長が総理との電話の内容を会議で公表したこともきっかけの一つでした総理大臣と党幹部の電話の内容はまさにトップシークレットでありそれが公にされることはなかなかありませんなぜ萩生田氏はそうした行動に出たのでしょうか<笑>あのまあ、えー、本来私はまあ、官房副長官も経験しましたんで、えー、まあ、そういった総理とのやり取りを外の方にお話しするっていうのは、えー、お作法としてですねあまり望ましくないと思ってますし、またそういうことを心がけてきたつもりだったんですけど、えー、本当に2回目の会議で、本当に皆さんがですね真剣に日本の将来心配して、発言を繰り返している中で、えー、財務大臣が官邸を訪問されて、えー、具体的なお話を始まったということを聞いて、それはちょっと、まあ、ある意味、禁じ手だなという思いがしましたんで、まあ、禁じ手には禁じ手で返したと。いうことでその場で皆さんにちょっと披露しましたけれど、まあ、やっぱり中身が決まって初めて規模が決まるんで、規模が先に決まったら、そこに中身を押し込まなきゃならないということになりますから、そこは政府・与党ですね、今回、お互いに反省して、しっかり連携できる体制を作っていきたいなと思います。
今回の件について自民党議員からはしっかりと党の声を伝えてくれて結果的に萩生田さんの株が上がったとの声が上がるなど萩生田氏の実務能力を評価する声が出ています一方今回の一連の出来事が浮き彫りにした課題もあります例えば政府が検討を進める防衛費の増額をめぐっては財源の確保などについて今後自民党と財務省での調整が行われますこうした際に国民を納得させるような結論を導くためにも適切な調整を行うことは欠かせません政府・与党が一枚岩になって課題に向き合っていけるかが問われてくると言えます最後まで見ていただきましてありがとうございますテレビ東京の経済ニュース経済番組をもっと見たいという方はこちらの画像をクリックしまして動画配信サービステレ東ビズにアクセスしてくださいどうぞよろしくお願いいたします What you are about to witness is the most exclusive first class from one of the best airlines in the world. It's unlike anything else in aviation, and the experience makes you wish your eight hour flight was 80 hours long. This is not an airplane seat, this is a hotel room in the sky. And if you're lucky enough to be traveling with someone else, you can experience something truly extraordinary. A real double bed at 40,000 feet. Come along to hear my thoughts on Singapore Airlines flagship Airbus E380 first class suites, and all about how I paid to show you how to do the same. I'm Nonstop Dan, a half Swede and half American who's been obsessed with airplanes for as long as I can remember. Over the past seven years, I've been lucky to call reviewing flights my job. And in that time, I've flown 150 different airlines, virtually all self funded because I'm really into this honesty thing. Nonstop Dan is all about trying to get as much value as possible with my miles, or when those are running low, my money. And then spreading the word so you guys get optimal value and can enjoy your travels to the max, and hopefully enjoy my geeky videos along the way. Our adventure starts in Gothenburg, Sweden, where Oscar and I flew down the day before and spent the night at an airport hotel in Frankfurt. Good morning. Check in closes in 10 minutes, so we gotta go. The following morning, we had to get up pretty early for our 8 30 a.m. departure. Since we were checking in pretty last minute, there was no line for any cabin, including Sweets class, of course. There were four passengers on board in Sweets, one of whom you might know. More on that later. Interestingly, at least three of these four first class passengers paid with miles, Oscar and myself included. So the cabin wasn't generating much in terms of revenue for the airline. While by no means cheap, if you can find a ward space, these suites are available for 86,000 miles per person one way from Frankfurt to New York or vice versa, and about 100 euros in taxes per person. This was expensive, but so worth it. I transferred these points from American Express to Singapore Airlines, which let me book the seats almost instantly. Right now, you can enjoy a massive 60 to 75,000 point sign up bonus on the American Express Gold Card. If you live in the US. Then, once you've found a ward space on Singapore Airlines website, you can simply transfer points directly to them and book. It doesn't get easier than that. US viewers can apply now before the bonus is gone at the link in the description. From check in, we cleared security and immigration before heading straight to the gate. Don't wanna be late. We're heading to the gate. As far as ground service, Singapore Airlines really does nothing. You have a first class check in desk. But then the experience until you board is the same as for all other passengers. And there she was, our Singaporean beauty. The most iconic airplane from one of the world's most iconic airlines. Whew, exciting. This aircraft had just arrived from a 13 hour overnight flight from Singapore. A good portion of the passengers on board were continuing from Singapore to New York, but everyone was forced to get off during the layover so the airplane could be properly cleaned. What a crazy and exhausting travel day for those people. With a total of only 230 passengers on board, our flight was nowhere near capacity though. Soon enough, Sweets class passengers were welcomed to board. And as we made our way to the front of the line, for all my Singaporean viewers, 
we felt damn atas. As a diehard ab geek and extremely frequent flyer, few things feel as good as boarding one of your favorite airlines for a flight in first class. The happiness, excitement, and overwhelming stress of trying to get everything on video is very real. Now, Singapore Airlines reconfigured A380s feature an entirely premium upper deck with 82 business class seats and a mere six first class suites. As a point of reference, Emirates, who has another excellent first class product, Product, crams 14 first class seats into the same space. That is just insane. Oscar and I were sitting in 1F and 2F, which convert into a double suite. The same goes for 1A and 2A, but row 3 doesn't offer this feature. Sadly, there's no way to make a triple suite, which would be interesting for families perhaps, but I imagine that would be a pretty limited use since few people travel this type of first class product in threes. We were greeted at the door by the two lovely lead flight attendants, Benjamin and Sandy, who led us to our seats. Our beyond incredible seats. <laughs> yes. This could be actually turned into a flat bed. Okay. And of course, if you want to have it like a queen size bed, you can always bring, uh, bring down one of the Amazing. Seats. First impressions. I'm just happy to be here. <laughs> <laughs> The middle wall was initially up, but the flight attendants offered to lower it so we could socialize even before takeoff. It's hard to describe the amount of space you feel here. Even in a solo seat, this is unlike anything else in this category. Obviously, the main feature of most first class seats, the chair, seems completely insignificant here. Yes, you have your comfortable chair that swivels to three preset seating configurations, but there's so much more. Benjamin insisted we start out the flight with some cheap champagne. Just a $300 bottle of 2008 Dom Perignon. We couldn't say no because if nothing else, it feels like you're drinking money, which, you know, is kind of a lavish state of mind. At this point, everything was going very quickly since the airline wanted to make up for lost time. So before we knew it, pushback had begun and the nostalgic Singapore Airlines safety video began to play. Welcome aboard Singapore Airlines. As the safety equipment on this aircraft may differ from that on other aircraft, Please give us your attention as we bring you through this important safety briefing and on a journey through Singapore. This has to be among my top five favorite safety videos of all time. I almost teared up seeing it for the first time in two years. As we taxied to the runway, we passed the low-cost airline known as Lufthansa and their low-cost subsidiary Eurowings. It made me think back to my business class fiasco with them earlier this year and made me so grateful that credit card points give me the flexibility to redeem miles with so many different airlines instead of being stuck with one since clearly some are far better than others. Getting these rewards cards or any type of credit for that matter all relies on one thing though a good credit score. Now, if you're in the US, your credit score is the primary tool used by lenders to determine whether or not you can get a loan for things like a car, a house, or even a child's education. The problem is that many Americans are ruining their credit scores by carrying high balances. The national average is $6,000 with an average interest of 15%. That is where today's video sponsor, Upstart, comes to the rescue. Whether you finally wanna get control of your credit cards, consolidate, high interest debt or fund important personal expenses. Over a million people have used Upstart to get one fixed monthly payment with a clear payoff date. Upstart knows that you are more than just your credit score. Their model considers other factors like your income, your employment, and any other information that you submit in your loan application to find you a smarter rate for your loan. You can check your rate without impacting your credit score in just five minutes for loans between $1,000 and $50,000 and potentially save a lot of money on your monthly interest payments. Learn more at upstart.com slash nonstop or at the link at the top of the description. That is upstart.com slash nonstop. With that, let's blast out of Frankfurt. Congratulations to this recent subscriber for winning a Singapore Airlines Suites amenity kit from Uber Lux brand Lalique. You guys can win awesome prizes in every video with no need to enter as long as you've hit that subscribe button. So welcome to our double suite on the Singapore Airlines Airbus A380. This is crazy. Let me show you around the seat. 
Whew, to be honest, it's overwhelming to try to show this suite on video. I mean, I had 8 hours in it and barely managed to learn about all the features. Let's start here in this part of the suite nearest the windows. Your chair swivels around to face the outside with a large surface that fits a laptop. There are three storage compartments on this surface with one containing a lit up mirror. There's also this detachable SQ style tablet that controls the entertainment system if you wish. Under that you have a huge selection of suite controls and charging and an HDMI port and you know one of these, not that I've ever had to use one on a plane. Storage certainly won't be a problem at this seat since there's a large storage bin under the window side console as well as enough storage for a freaking body bag under the bed. Even better, there's a full closet by the suite entrance that would have fit 10 of my backpacks. It even has hangers and a pretty large mirror. Turning 90 degrees to the rear wall, there's another surface with a beautiful fake orchid, a stylish lamp, and the tray table which is massive. There's an additional charging port here, allowing you to power up multiple devices at once in your suite. In the armrest of the chair, you'll find a remote that also controls the entertainment system, along with some seat swivel controls. Now if you want, the TV swivels to face your chair. But who wants to watch TV from a chair when you can watch TV from a separate bed? The wonderful crew offered to make the bed almost immediately after takeoff and how could we decline? Ironically, the bed has more modes of recline than the chair, and you can go from almost upright to fully lie flat. You get these two incredibly plush pillows, the best I can remember getting on a plane, and this comfortable, sleek cover with a mattress pattern beneath. I will say the bed is surprisingly hard, I guess it's Southeast Asian style, but one piece of feedback I have is that it would be amazing to have different types of mattress pads that let you adjust if you want a softer or harder bed. That's literally my one piece of constructive criticism in this video. Now look at this, I'd rather take this hard bed in Singapore Airlines suites over pretty much any other first class seat any day. Now another great thing about this suite, as you might have guessed, is the closing door. It gives you utmost privacy and a private jet-like feeling that's only rivaled by Emirates 777 Game Changer, which is only available on 9 planes, or Etihad's A380 apartments. The patterns on Singapore Airlines doors allows for small holes for the crew to peep through to know if they can enter, if you've finished your meal, etc. But when seated, the middle section of the door perfectly blocks the exterior, giving you complete privacy. It's also a nice touch that the door pattern continues onto the cabin ceiling lights. It's this attention to detail that makes you appreciate Singapore Airlines even more. Lastly, I guess we should say that there were no individual air vents, but the cabin was kept at the perfect temperature throughout the flight. If you've watched my videos before, you know I value good onboard service more than most people. To me, a good crew is essential for a good flight. And oh boy, this crew was as good as they come. Right after settling in, every suite's passenger gets welcomed on board, by name of course. of Senate Democrats and Republicans who spent the day today announcing on the Senate floor how they will vote on his acquittal or removal. So the timing here could be better. On the other hand, the president does give this speech with the certainty that he will be acquitted tomorrow. It would take a two-thirds vote to remove him. And at this point, it looks like it's going to be a vote that comes down largely on party lines. And Nancy, you see the Speaker of the House just tried to shake the president's hand and he refused or perhaps did not see her hand. As I mentioned, there's a lot of tension between the two of them. And he did not extend his to her in the Inflation Reduction Act. When every one of you knows, every time you go to the grocery store, every time you go to fill up your gas tank, 
Every time you're realizing that every dollar you earn is worth less and less as inflation continues to rise. So it doesn't matter what sticker they place on a bill or how they try to message it. They are so far out of touch with the reality of the challenges that we are facing in our everyday lives that they have forgotten their purpose. They do lie. And why is it? Why do they lie? Because they care more for their power than they do for the people. And that's where I have found so much hope and inspiration, whether we're talking about the divisiveness coming from the Democratic Party, using identity politics to tear us apart, racializing everything. Every single problem, unfortunately, now has been reduced to race. So much so that they're using our taxpayer dollars to go into our elementary schools and tell kids that you are either the oppressor or the oppressed because of the color of your skin. That you're either privileged or a victim because of the color of your skin, fomenting racism. We got Hawaii in the house tonight. It is a great day to be an American. There is one thing that we share in common, and it is that pride in who we are as Americans. It is that pride in the foundation of this country and our God-given freedoms enshrined in the Constitution. And it is our belief in our potential for our future. Because that potential lies in each and every one of our hearts and it lies within each and every one of our hands and our voices. So no matter how much the establishment in Washington, the partisan powerful elite, the special corporate interests seek to drown out our voices, we, the people, hold the power in our hands. And every one of you are proof of that. I'm so glad to be here tonight. And a few people asked me as I was coming here, they found out I was coming here, they're like, you're going to support Carrie Lake. That seems a little odd. <laughs> Do you agree? No, it's not odd. <laughs> and that was my answer to this reporter who asked me that question. I said, it's only odd if you're focused on the wrong things. If you're paying attention you recognize that what we share in common, Carrie and I and every one of you, is that pride. And it is the courage that comes with that pride. It is having clear eyes to recognize the very real problems that we face. It is clear eyes to recognize the threats to our safety, to our borders, to our communities, to our families and our kids that are coming from today's so-called woke radical Democrat party and why it is so important for us to have strong leaders in power now, strong leaders who are accountable solely to the people, solely to you, not to those who believe that they deserve power. And we've seen it, I know you've seen it here in Arizona, you guys had a hard fought primary election. And I know we're seeing it certainly in Washington and this isn't something that's just left to one party or another, it's to people who have had their stranglehold on power for so long, they have forgotten who is most important, the American people. And we're seeing it and feeling it every day. And this is why I'm here to support Carrie for governor. Because I know that in her heart, she's doing this because she works for you. She is asking every single one of you in Arizona for the privilege of serving you. That you are the one who is hiring her and she'll never forget that. That when you look at the challenges with the border, you hear people like Kamala Harris saying, well, the border is secure. Even as, even as a, a normally biased reporter says, well, hold on a second. 
we're seeing millions of people, record high numbers of people illegally crossing the border. How can you say it's secure? She says, well, it's secure. This is the same kind of fantasy lies that we're hearing from those in power when they say, we're passing the Inflation Reduction Act. When every one of you knows, every time you go to the grocery store, every time you go to fill up your gas tank, every time you're realizing that every dollar you earn is worth less and less as inflation continues to rise. So it doesn't matter what sticker they place on a bill or how they try to message it. They are so far out of touch with the reality of the challenges that we are facing in our everyday lives that they have forgotten their purpose. They do lie. And why is it? Why do they lie? Because they care more for their power than they do for the people. And that's where I have found so much hope and inspiration, whether we're talking about the divisiveness coming from the Democratic Party, using identity politics to tear us apart, racializing everything. Every single problem, unfortunately, now has been reduced to race. So much so that they're using our taxpayer dollars to go into our elementary schools and tell kids that you are either the oppressor or the oppressed because of the color of your skin that you're either privileged or a victim because of the color of your skin, fomenting racism. We got Hawaii in the house tonight. It is a great day to be an American. There is one thing that we share in common and it is that pride in who we are as Americans, it is that pride in the foundation of this country and our God-given freedoms enshrined in the Constitution. And it is our belief in our potential for our future. Because that potential lies in each and every one of our hearts, and it lies within each and every one of our hands and our voices. So no matter how much the establishment in Washington, the partisan powerful elite, the special corporate interests seek to drown out our voices. We, the people, hold the power in our hands. And every one of you are proof of that. I'm so glad to be here tonight. And a few people asked me as I was coming here, they found out I was coming here. They're like, you're going to support Carrie Lake. That seems a little odd. <laughs> Do you agree? No, it's not odd. <laughs> and that was my answer to this reporter who asked me that question. I said, it's only odd if you're focused on the wrong things. If you're paying attention you recognize that what we share in common, Carrie and I and every one of you, is that pride. And it is the courage that comes with that pride. It is having clear eyes to recognize the very real problems that we face. It is clear eyes to recognize the threats to our safety, to our borders, to our communities, to our families and our kids that are coming from today's so-called woke radical Democrat party and why it is so important for us to have strong leaders in power now, strong leaders who are accountable solely to the people, solely to you, not to those who believe that they deserve power. And we've seen it, I know you've seen it here in Arizona, you guys had a hard fought primary election. And I know we're seeing it certainly in Washington and this isn't something that's just left to one party or another, it's to people who have had their stranglehold on power for so long, they have forgotten who is most important, the American people. And we're seeing it and feeling it every day. And this is why I'm here to support Carrie for governor. Because I know that in her heart, she's doing this because she works for you. She is asking every single one of you in Arizona for the privilege 
of serving you. That you are the one who is hiring her and she'll never forget that. That when you look at the challenges with the border, you hear people like Kamala Harris saying, well, the border is secure. Even as, even as a, a normally biased reporter says, well, hold on a second. We're seeing millions of people, record high numbers of people illegally crossing the border. How can you say it's secure? She says, well, it's secure. This is the same kind of fantasy lies that we're hearing from those in power when they say, we're passing the Inflation Reduction Act. When every one of you knows, every time you go to the grocery store, every time you go to fill up your gas tank, every time you're realizing that every dollar you earn is worth less and less as inflation continues to rise. So it doesn't matter what sticker they place on a bill or how they try to message it. They are so far out of touch with the reality of Absolutely. In the comments, a video that uh, our uh, social video director, Nico Pitney, uh, recorded explaining some of the early warning signs that President Trump appears to have ignored that could have allowed him to respond sooner to this crisis. Since he recorded that video, we have uh, learned new things. Uh, the Washington Post reported this week that on more than a dozen nos enlazamos directamente a este desfile. En este momento, el presidente de la República se traslada a la hasta bandera monumental para izar nuestro lábaro patrio. Lo acompañan los secretarios de la Defensa Nacional y de Marina. El presidente de la República realizará el izamiento de nuestro lábaro patrio. A nuestros connacionales se les pide reality of the challenges that we are facing in our everyday lives that they have forgotten their purpose. They do lie. And why is it? Why do they lie? Because they care more for their power than they do for the people. And that's where I have found so much hope and inspiration, whether we're talking about the divisiveness coming from the Democratic Party, using identity politics to tear us apart, racializing everything. Every single problem, unfortunately, now has been reduced to race. So much so that they're using our taxpayer dollars to go into our elementary schools and tell kids that you are either the oppressor or the oppressed because of the color of your skin. That you're either privileged or a victim because of the color of your skin, fomenting racism. We got Hawaii in the house tonight. It is a great day to be an American. There is one thing that we share in common, and it is that pride in who we are as Americans. It is that pride 
in the foundation of this country and our God-given freedoms enshrined in the Constitution. And it is our belief in our potential for our future. Because that potential lies in each and every one of our hearts. And it lies... One of the richest men on earth, Jeff Bezos, needs no introduction. Bezos, who is widely known as the founder and former CEO of the e-commerce giant Amazon, is also a computer engineer and an investor. As the founder of Blue Origin, a suborbital spaceflight service, an aerospace manufacturing company, Bezos has spent some time in space, and he's looking forward to spending more time. But when he's down on Earth, Bezos rides some of the most expensive and rarest vehicles on the planet. With a net worth of over $178 billion, Jeff Bezos can splash over $20 million on cars without breaking a sweat. Here's everything you would find in Jeff Bezos' garage. 6. 1997 Honda Accord With so much money, it's shocking that Jeff Bezos has a 1997 Honda Accord. This was actually a replacement for his 1987 Chevy Blazer, and when asked by CBS's Bob Simon why he got such a simple car, he responded, this is a perfectly good car. Bear in mind that at the time, Bezos was worth over $10 billion. 5. Koenigsegg CCXR Trevita The Koenigsegg CCXR Trevita is one of the rarest and most expensive cars in Bezos' collection. Up until Koenigsegg introduced the white carbon weave bodywork for the Trevita, all other carmakers could only lay their hands on the traditional black carbon fibers. When sunlight hits the Trevita, it sparkles like it has a million tiny white diamonds on its body. イテウォンの雑踏事故から5日現場に残されたものを保管する体育館で一つ一つ確認するように歩くのは亡くなった富川芽生さんの父親芽生さんの遺品を探してみて回るがそれらしきものは見当たらないしかしパソコンのリストを見てみると。トミカワって、いや、これ、これ、これ、これ、これ、これ、これ、これ、これ、これ、これ、これ、これ、これ、これ、これ、これ、これ、これ、これ、これ、これ、これ、これ、これ、これ、これ、これ、これ、これ、これ、これ、これ、これ、これ、これ、これ、これ、これ、これ、これ、これ、これ、This PBS News special is a co-production of PBS NewsHour and Frontline, with major support from and the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, and from viewers like you. Thank you. Special Counsel Robert Mueller has delivered his final report to the Department of Justice. There are no further indictments being recommended. That's a big deal. President Trump declares victory. It was a complete and total exoneration. Amid calls to release Mueller's entire report. Democrats and Republicans demanding the full release of the report. There was no collusion with Russia. The story behind the Mueller investigation. Justice Department naming special counsel to take over the investigation. Tonight, a groundbreaking collaboration between... I would like to share with you a story which I saw... The horns honking and and i was right downtown but y you wouldn't want a big rig to pull up for example in front of your parents home and park and idle for 24 hours a day for several weeks honking their horn you wouldn't want that would you miss leach well mr champ my ex-husband was a tool push on a drilling rig and i've spent many time many days on the site of a drilling rig and there's a lot of diesel fumes and there's a lot of noise yeah it's not pleasant is it 
it is it is what it is <laughs> yeah but then you get to go home and you get to get away from that noise and those diesel fumes right uh not when you're living on on site no now i want to ask you some questions about the injunction we uh on February 4th to the 5th, you heard about that there was a motion from the, the residents of Ottawa to get an injunction to, to stop the, the horn honking, correct? Yes. And uh, we heard from Mr. Wilson a bit about that, that there was uh, a meeting of uh, the board or the leadership group about what to do, and there was a decision to oppose the injunction, correct? I've never opposed the injunction. Well, you swore an affidavit to oppose the injunction, Ms. Leach. Let's let's be clear on that. Right? Well, once it was imposed, of course, we weren't going to go against the injunction. Well, no, there was a court hearing on Monday, February the 7th, where Mr. Wilson represented you and Mr. Barber and Mr. Dichter, who were named individuals on it, to oppose the injunction. You, you, were, you weren't aware that that's what, that's what the position I, you were taking? I don't recall that, but if you say so, then... And you, you swore an affidavit in support. Three long blasts and music. Ihr Arbeitsplatz, 40 Meter hoch, 250 Meter lang. Sie ist verantwortlich für 2400 Urlauber. Starboard 10. Yes. Guten Tag. Nicole Langosch ist Deutschlands erste Chefin auf einem Kreuzfahrtschiff. Kapitän, hallo? Ein Job mit hohen Ansprüchen. Die 35-Jährige steuert das Schiff. 640 Mitarbeiter hören auf ihr Kommando. Und dann ist die Pier zu kurz für uns und wir stehen ein paar Meter über und das ist halt alles nicht schön. え、核ロシアに供与しようとしているという風に分析をしています。じゃあまずそのロシア側の事情を見てみますと、ロシアなんと言っても武器が欲しい。今ウクライナに侵攻しかけています。武器が足りないんじゃないかという話もあります。武器が欲
Uh, somebody uh, needs to be here presiding uh, while I go vote, and I won't uh, I'll run over and run back, and, uh, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll do the questioning according to the fall of the gavel or, or uh, early birds, uh, whichever rule applies. Uh, Director Comey, uh, welcome. Uh, we thank the FBI for what it does to keep America safe. There's been a lot of controversy surrounding the FBI since the last time you were here in 2015. In March, you publicly acknowledged that the FBI is investigating allegations of coordination between the Trump uh, campaign and Russia's efforts to interfere in the 2016 election. Under President Obama's order, former DNI Clapper had been in charge of the intelligence community's review of that in inference. Mr. Clapper testified that President Obama asked the intelligence community to compile all available information. After he left office, Mr. Clapper said there was no evidence of collusion whatsoever. The New York Times reported that American officials found no proof of collusion. He published a dossier spinning wild conspiracy theories about the Trump campaign. BuzzFeed acknowledged that the claims were unverified and some of the details were clearly wrong. BuzzFeed has since been sued for publishing them. Since then, much of the dossier has been proven wrong and many of his outlandish claims have failed to gain traction. For example, no one's looking for moles or Russian agents embedded in the DNC. Yet some continue to quote parts of this document as if it were gospel truth. And according to press reports, the FBI has relied on the document to justify its current investigation. There have been reports that the FBI agreed to pay the author of the dossier, who paid his sources, who also paid their subsources. Where did the money come from? And what motivated the people writing the checks? The company that oversaw the dossier's creation uh, Fusion GSP uh, won't uh, speak to that point either. Its founder, Glenn Simpson, is refusing to cooperate with this company's, uh, committee's invest investigation and inquiry. His company is also the subject of a complaint to the Justice Department. That complaint alleges that Fusion worked as an unregistered foreign agent for Russian interests and with a former Russian intelligence agency at the time it worked on the dossier. It was filed with the Justice Department in July, long before the dossier came out. The man who wrote the dossier admitted in court that it has unverified claims. Does that sound like a reliable basis for law enforcement or intelligence actions? Unfortunately, the FBI has provided me materially inconsistent information about these issues. That is why we need to know more about it, how much the FBI relied on it. Once you buy into the claim of collusion, then suddenly every interaction with a Russian can be twisted to seem like confirmation of a conspiracy theory. Now, I obviously don't know what the FBI will find. For the good of the country, I hope that the FBI gets to the truth soon, whatever that truth or that answer may be. If there are wrongdoers, they should be punished, and the innocent should have their names cleared. And in the meantime, this committee is charged with the oversight of the FBI, and we can't wait until this is all over to ask the hard questions. Uh, otherwise, too many people will have no confidence in FBI's conclusions. The public needs to know what role the dossier has played and where it came from. And we need to know whether there was anything improper going on between the Trump campaign and the Russians. Or are these mere allegations just a partisan smear campaign that manipulated our government into choosing, chasing a conspiracy theory. Now, before the election, and before we knew about this notorious dossier, 
you, Chairman Comey, publicly released his findings that Secretary Clinton uh, was extremely careless in the handling of highly classified information, and this recommendation has no one, uh, and, and his recommendation that no one be prosecuted. According to a recent New York Times article, uh, he did it partly because he knew the Russians had a hacked email from a Democrat operative that might be released before the election. That email reportedly provided assurances that Attorney General Lynch would protect Secretary Clinton and make sure the FBI, quote unquote, didn't go too far. Despite Attorney General Lynch's prior connections to the Clintons and her now famous private conversation with former President Clinton during the investigation, she failed to recuse herself from that. The director's announcement effectively gave her cover uh, to have it both ways. She would appear publicly uninvolved but remain in control of the ultimate outcome. Moreover, in its haste to end a tough, politically charged investigation, the FBI failed to follow up on credible evidence of the intent to hide, hide federal records from the Congress and the public. It is a federal crime, as we know, to willfully and unlawfully conceal, remove, or destroy a federal record. Director Comey said that, quote, the FBI also discovered several thousands work-related emails, end of quote, that Secretary Clinton did not turn over to the State Department. He said the Secretary Clinton's lawyers, quote, cleaned their devices in such a way as to preclude complete forensic recovery, end of quote, of additional emails. The Justice Department also entered into immunity agreements limiting the scope of the FBI investigation. Some of these agreements prohibited the FBI from reviewing any emails on the laptops of the Clinton aides that were created outside of Secretary Clinton's tenure at state. But of course, any emails related to alienating records would not have been created until after she left office during the congressional and FBI reviews. And even though these records were subject to congressional subpoena and preservation records, the Justice Department agreed to destroy the laptops. So a cloud of doubt hangs over the FBI objectivity. The director says that the people at the FBI don't give a rip about politics, but uh, the director installed uh, as deputy director a man whose wife ran for elected office and accepted almost a million dollars from Governor Terry McAuliffe, a longtime friend and fundraiser of the Clintons and the Democratic Party. Andrew McCabe also reported
Wow, this is cool.